I am Barbara Brent, and I'm with the National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disabilities, otherwise known as NASDES, and we're very pleased to be with you today. Just so that you know just a little bit about the rhythm of the day here is that you will get a break, and uh, we're going to start out, uh, Shelly's going to walk us through the framework of the community of practice, and then you'll be doing a little bit of a group exercise, then I'll walk you through uh, quite a bit, but in a short time, of uh, the different things going on across the country and how that may connect with Connecticut and what Connecticut uh, has given to the group as well. Uh, and then there'll be some Connecticut specific activities and planning. So thank you very much again for taking time out of your day to be with us. Uh huh, uh huh, ah, whoa, so exciting. Uh, so, uh, my name is Barb Brent, and just a little bit about me, uh, that's at least some members of my family. Um, I am the Director of State Policy of NASDES. I'm going to be there five years. Uh, before then, uh, I was in the Commissioner of Arizona System, and before then, I was the Commissioner of Tennessee System. You know, I won't go on and on, I've been a case manager, been a provider, and um, one of the things that is, we're all proud of our families, right? But um, we're a family of very mixed cultures and we just found out that my grandchild has been diagnosed as having a disability and our family's very well prepared because my oldest son always got some of the terminology confused and he would say both my parents work with children with possibilities. So that's going to work for the future. And uh, Shelly, why don't you say a little bit about yourself? All right. Our, back, our mics are going to um, counteract. Yeah, we'll have to just turn it off. So I'm Shelly Reynolds, and I'm with the University of Missouri Kansas City Institute for Human Development, where I've been working for the last 20 years working on projects specifically related to supporting self advocates and families with disabilities. Um, I really come to the table um, with experience. I have a brother who's 33 with developmental disabilities who receives services in Missouri from the, the state DD service system. Um, I always say that I'm most proud though of spending 12 years, what I would call, in the trenches with the self-advocacy movement. And if you've never had the opportunity to really be involved with the self-advocacy movement, that's where you have the best learning, I think. And I always say my best learning actually came from riding in the car for hours with self-advocates or sitting at the bar and really understanding what life is really all about. We can sit in all these meetings and have really, really great discussions, but when you really, really get down to what life is about, that's really where, where you really learn about it. I had the opportunity about six to eight years ago to really start focusing on the role of family in our field. So it's not to, to negate the role of self-advocates, but really how do you bring both of those movements together? And in that, I had the opportunity to work on a national initiative to write what's called the, we call it our wing spread report for short, where we really look to define what does family support look like for our nation and what does it really mean for developmental disabilities. Um, that report then turned into now the project that you're sitting here and you're involved with at the community of practice. Um, I also um, am the director of our statewide family resource center that we've been running for about 25 years now. And so we serve about 2,500 families who call in for information or peer support or leadership development. So I know firsthand what my family information specialists are doing in terms of what's going on in the lives of families. So having that, that, that time-specific time information to be able to really think through practices and policies on this initiative is a really, really great addition to have at the table. Anything else you want to add to that? All right. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the project. Um, obviously, it's the community of practice. We are in our fourth year right now. Um, it's funded through the, um, for the federal government through the Administration for Developmental Disabilities. And really what we're tasked with is really bringing groups of people together in states and saying, what's really working well in terms of supporting families and what can we do better? And how can we learn from the state of Washington, the District of Columbia, and Missouri, and, and share all of those, those different types of things? So we're both going to be sharing the successes. You guys have done wonderful things. Um, we brag about Connecticut all over the country, so we don't feel your um, budget woes. We see all the cool things that you're doing. 
So we'll remind you of those this morning. Um, and we'll also share with you what some of the other states are doing as well. We are in six states, with Missouri being what we call our mentor state, because um, we had done some initial work before the community of practice um, had started. So we're in Tennessee, Oklahoma, District of Columbia, the state of Washington. Um, we call the district um, uh, a state. They really like that. Um, and really what we're charged with, the first thing we were charged with is, is really come together and unite our field around a framework for really having language to talk about how are we going to change the way we support families. You know, we know our field came around in the 1950s because of families, but how are we really going to get our, our policies and our structures in our state more in line with what families really need? And so um, we're sort of charged with developing that framework. So we're going to spend a, 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 the morning giving you the language of that framework, which ironically has evolved into becoming tools and different things people are using. But the real intent of that framework was to give us all common language around the country to really be able to have this conversation. The other thing that we're charged with is, is how can we use that framework so states can make real changes in their states that they can sustain? So we can identify specific policy changes, practice changes, and share those with you as well. The last part is, is these six states, how can we also scale that up across the nation? And so what's really exciting is, is we have 12 more states joining the community of practice starting in July. So this framework will have spread to over 18 states pretty quickly, and that's pretty exciting. So I really want to start with this, and the commissioner really kind of addressed many of these things, but you know, why are we having this conversation? And if you really think about it, you know, we're talking about expectations and values, and that's really why our field really even started. And then all this other stuff started happening. We had a higher increase for services, demand for services. We have less money to do what we need to do to serve more people. Our workforce is completely changing, not only in our field, but in many fields. So we have all of these pressures coming at us. At the same time, we also have new federal policies that are coming to the table. And we've been going around in Missouri and talking about all the new home and community-based rules. And, and as annoying as those appear, uh, feel to everybody, I say, you know, the federal government is finally responding to our expectations and to our value base. And now we have to figure out how to implement it. So for a long time, we've been saying we want community-based supports. And the federal government now said, I agree, we need to make that happen. And now we're all scrambling to figure out how to put that into practice again. So when we really start thinking about it, that's why we're here at the table. The other reason we're at the table is because what we're trying to do is align practices and policies with the current reality. We know people with disabilities are living at home with their families, or we know that they're being supported somehow by their family, even if they're not living in that family home. And as a field, what we've recognized is that our services and supports have really only focused on those that are receiving residential supports. And so when we start talking about our field, we forget that 89% of all the 4.9 million, 4.7 million people with developmental disabilities actually are supported by a family. So we have people say, well, you're just having this conversation because the states don't have any money. No, the reason I think we're having the conversation is because the states need to get in line with the reality that families are an important part of the infrastructure of the long-term service system and that the way the service systems are currently designed, they're not paying attention to the role of family. And how can we really elevate that role of the family? So we talked about the, the wing spread document. And what really came from that was really figuring out how do we define supports to families? Because people have been using the phrase family support for a long time, um, especially in the 80s it really came about. And as a field, every single organization defines family support very, very differently. So the, the reason for the wing spread uh, event that we hosted was to say, how can we unite around a definition for family support? And what came from that was really recognizing that families have three very specific types of needs. They have the needs for goods and services, and that's actually what's focused on the most, are the goods and services, the respite, the accommodations, transportation, and those sorts of things, which are all very, very important. But what we also know, both from being family members, talking to family members, and the research is showing us 
that one of the number one needs is information. And that's the number one thing that usually goes away right away when we have budget cuts. So how can we really put in family support and defining family support and having people recognize the need for information? But what we also need is the need to talk to one another. We know from talking to other families and being connected that, that we have a higher level of being able to get out of bed in the morning and keep doing what we're doing. And so if we're not addressing the social emotional aspects of being a family, then it's really, really hard to address some of the day-to-day -day issues. So we really want to start people, having people recognize that if you're going to fund and you're going to develop programs and policies related to family support, you have to address all three of what we call the buckets. The other thing about this definition that, that was new to really defining family supports is that the self-advocacy movement really, really started to push back against the family support movement in the 90s, in the early 2000s. And I believe that the reason they started to do that is no different than a teenager really trying to become independent from their family. And so their struggle to really be a strong self-advocacy movement with a very strong voice was their attempt to say, you know what, we have nothing to do with the family movement. They do not speak on our behalf. And they're absolutely right. And so what we t attempted to do with the new definition is to really unite those two movements. It's not about how do we make lives for people with disabilities better at the expense of families, or how do we make families better at the expense of the voice of self-advocates, but rather, how do we support all of the individual members to be productive and self-determined and integrated, no matter who the members of the family are? At the same time, how can we also support that family unit? And that's what we're attempting to do with this definition up here. The other thing that we do is if we really look at the way that family support was defined or the programs and practices that evolved from family support, it was really about a program. And you had to be eligible to get the services. And it was typically crisis driven. You'd call um, and, and receive the supports if you were in crisis. If you go around the state and you look at the legislation from the, from the 90s, you will find written in most legislation that the reason that they funded family support programs was to prevent long-term services outside of the home because they were costly. And what we wanted to do was actually emphasize that the reason we want to support families is because we want strong families first. And it's not the primary goal just to save money. The other thing that we really wanted to do was to move from that crisis, uh, crisis sort of response to how can we prevent crisis? How can we promote strong families and good lives and not just create programs that were there to respond when somebody went into crisis? And so that's really what the new framework is all about. The other thing about the framework is, is if you look at family support programs, many of them define family by who is eligible and typically it's mom and dad are the main caregiver. And when we wanted to develop a framework, it wasn't about a program. It wasn't a framework for a program, but it was a framework for a way of thinking. So when we define family, it's defined by how, whoever def defines themselves as being related to someone who experiences disability. And the reason that's important is, is we know relationships are so important in all of our lives. So if you're a grandma, if you're an aunt, uncle, if you're a neighbor and somebody has a developmental disability, you want to know how to support that person. And so how can we figure out ways to, to have all the people in the lives of people with disabilities have the support they need to really help everyone have a good life? The other thing that we recognize, and I don't know if any of you have read the book by Hans Mesner called Creating Blue Space. He uh, works in our field and, and it's really, really uses um, some of the language um, that comes out of MIT related to transformation. And he talks about that it's time in our field to really move beyond just transition and to really start thinking about transformation. Now we have a tendency to use those words, um, we just change those words around and use them, but they have very, very different meaning. So if you think about our field, how did our field evolve? It was in the early 1800s. We started as an institutional um, system, right? And we've continued to be an institutional system up until the last 100 years, where we've started to wanting to start evolving into being more of a community-based system. But what that tells us is that our DNA, our foundation, started from an institutional base. So all the changes that we make, we are incrementally making changes, but starting with the fact that we're an institutional-based system. 
So if we're just incrementally changing, we just continue to tweak little things to try to get to become a community-based system. And we're realizing it's not working very well. And so what Hans is really proposing to us is how do we really transform the way that we think? And we can't just doing it by changing the names of things, which we do in our field, right? We went from being case managers, being service coordinators, and now we're support coordinators, and we, we always have new titles. But are we fundamentally changing the roles of some of these things in our field? You know, I used to, I read that book and thought, well, that's, how's that gonna happen? But you look at countries like Australia, or you look at providences in, the, in Canada, and they are actually starting to do that. They're saying, we can't just continue to evolve from our historical institutional system. We have got to start from scratch and start a new community-based system. So how can we do that in the US and still support people and make the change that we need to? So we really look at this concept around transformational change. And the first thing around transformational change is creating common language around a value base that people can relate to. And for us, that's what the framework really means and why we created it. We utilize these pictures to really hone in and think about that framework. And so what we know is that all individuals exist among their family and their community. That's all of us in the United States. But we know that people with developmental disabilities need services at times. And as you think about the history of our service system, we've become the circles in the middle. And we've done everything we can to make our services as good as we possibly can. We've really focused internally and said, how can we do this? And all the while that we were doing this, we weren't paying attention to the fact that it was our services themselves that were actually creating the barrier to community life, the barrier to connecting with our families. So if you think about it, if a person goes and receives professional supports and we wrap that person around there, whether it's in the school setting or in early childhood or even in adulthood, we wrap recreation services, we wrap transportation services, we wrap residential supports around that person, all the while we're unintentionally cutting out their relationships. All the while we're removing them from the communities that they know. And so how can we do this? How can we think about supporting people in a different way, but not taking away their supports. So what, what we're pro proposing is, is how can we create lives more like everybody else, but really create integrated supports that do not take people away from the relationships and the communities that they live in. At the core is the belief that we believe all people have the right to live, love, work, and play. This is the core belief of our entire framework. And what you'll see there is the word rights. And, and the commissioner actually addressed this as well. This isn't just about health and safety. This is about the rights of American citizens. And our job as a field is to help people live out those rights. And we haven't always done that as a field. Sometimes our services themselves actually take away the rights for people with disabilities. The other important component about this belief system is that it says all people. Rarely will you see in our framework the use of the phrase people with disabilities because the thing is is that we universally have to make good lives for all citizens in Connecticut and the United States. And if we just create standards for people with developmental disabilities, we're creating different standards for people with disabilities than all citizens. So the framework is universal and can be used amongst all target populations and all people. The other thing is, is that we really want to try um, to focus on that definition from the wing spread report. And that's really become a big outcome area for us. The most important thing about this framework, and I addressed it I, well, a little I, bit. I know our mics are going to interfere with each other, but I see people writing, you will get this. It's too big a file to, to have done, so it'll be uploaded for and so it's okay, you don't need to write down everything. We'll send you the link to this. We also, the, 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 uh, another major part of our framework is thinking about the concept of awe. And the reason we really started to do that is, is, is we really looked at the other frameworks and we looked at the other things that we were really doing in our field. And we started to recognize that those frameworks were really for the systems that served people with disabilities. And if you start really looking and recognizing that only one out of four people with developmental disabilities will ever have contact with your formal developmental disability service system, 
The framework can't just be about one form. The framework needs to be a framework that encompasses the all. So if I, if I identify as being a family member of an individual with a developmental disabilities, this framework needs to be able to support me in my thinking and in my practices, not just for those that are inside the service system. So what does that number really mean? So if you take the prevalence rate of 1.58 and you take the, the US census rate, what that tells you is, is we have between 4.7 and 4.9 million people with developmental disabilities in our nation. Where the other number comes from is what we know in terms of people that um, are, are known to their state DD service systems. So what that looks like and from a state perspective is here's Ohio's. They know that they have 183,000 people in the state of Ohio. They also know who they serve and how they serve them. So if you start looking at their data, they can tell you, we know that 29% are known. Now they might not be receiving the services, but they're known. The other thing they know is who is actually receiving their services. So that tells them if they're going to be in this community of practice, that they have to start thinking about how are they touching the all, even if they never talk to them or even if they never serve them. And so that's a whole new way of thinking. And I will tell you, when we first started this project like three and a half years ago, I remember some state directors going, oh my gosh, we already don't have enough funding and now you're going to go out and find more people and bring them to us? That is not the intent of this project. The intent of this project is to say, where are those people living? What are they already accessing? And how can we get to them in different ways and get them the information that they need to have the good lives? But the most important thing about these numbers is the 49%, how are they doing it? If they have a really good life, shouldn't we actually be looking at how they're doing that and try to replicate that? And so it requires us to think about our needs assessment differently. It, talk, it requires us to figure out different ways to have conversations with the all, not only representing the voice of those that we know about. So this is the data for Connecticut. There's a big bunch of question marks up on there because we had questions about the data from Connecticut. But what we can tell you is you have 3.59 million citizens in the United States. So we can tell you that's about 52,000 people with developmental disabilities. And I know there's someone sitting in this room that can tell us more, there you are, <laughs> about the numbers. She was here yesterday and she was filling us in on some of the numbers. So your number is about 17,000 for that part of that triangle over there. The reason why I also think that's really important is if you're involved in any advocacy work or working on the state budgets or anything, usually legislators think your all is just the right hand side of that triangle. They think 17,000 people are the all that they're trying to figure out how to support. And what they don't recognize is that there's this other percentage of people who actually aren't even known to the service system. And so when people are working on advocacy, it's really, really important to give them the correct data. The other thing that's the major, obviously, focus of this initiative is, is how do we really think about the person within the context of the family? And it's been really interesting bringing that conversation to the table because we have many state agencies say to us, we are a person-centered system shell. We don't need to be involved in this family project. And if we're person-centered, we're not really focused on what the family needs. And I keep saying to them, being person-centered means you need to pay attention to the aspects of the family, to, to maybe the impact the family had on the individual, good and bad. What diversity do they bring to the table? What, what um, rituals and culture are they bringing to the table? What likes and dislikes? It could be their food preference. It could be the way they celebrate holidays or birthdays. You can't ignore the impact of the family on the individual person if you're gonna pro provide supports to them. That's the first thing. The other thing is, is if we know the data showing us that 89% of people, whether they're getting services or not, are supported somehow by their family, we can't ignore the family. 
If we're going in to support a person that lives in a family home, we have to pay attention to the family environment. We need to be respectful of whether mom and dad are in their 80s and we're trying to figure out how to support this individual. The types of services we provide them are gonna change depending on the family and those that are providing those supports to that person. We also need to be thinking not only about what that person does, but also the, the experiences of that family unit. And so when we're talking about supporting a person within the context of the family, that's what we're talking about here. The other major principle of the supporting families framework is really thinking about this concept of trajectory. And really where that comes from, again, is trying to move away from this concept of being crisis driven, of having, of having only responding when someone comes to the table, but rather helping people really think through, let me help you now, but we also have to have an eye on the future. And where this really comes into play is, is let's, let's think about younger families for a second. They absolutely have a lot of things that they are, they are handling right now. Supporting a child, supporting a child maybe with a disability, um, and taking care of all these things. So there's a lot going on in their lives. And so what we've had a tendency to do in our field is only say, they have a lot of things going on. I can't talk to them about the future. They can't handle it right now. But by doing that, what we're not doing is steadying, or creating stepping stones to what future possibilities can be. If I don't help a mom and dad understand that even though their child has a diagnosis of Down syndrome, that, that the expectations of living in the community and having good relationships and maybe having a job one day are possibilities for the future, then they aren't doing things day to day to lead to the trajectory towards that type of outcome. So we're sitting here wondering why people in their 20s all of a sudden just found out that maybe they should start thinking about employment. That's our fault. We didn't begin those conversations and expectations at a very, very early age. So as a field, we have to start taking responsibility for the different life stages. You know, if we're sitting here at the six, we can't blame unemployment on of people with developmental disabilities on folk rehab. We need to start thinking about what early childhood should be doing to set those expectations. How are mom and dad creating um, conversations around chores and money and adapting those to whatever, whatever the child's abilities are? That's how we're gonna start moving things to good life outcomes in the future. The other thing is, is really putting the concept around anticipatory guidance into our field. In the medical field, they do this all the time. You go to the doctor's office and they'd say to you, you know, um, are you smoking, not smoking? You shouldn't smoke. You know, are you riding a bike? Are you wearing a helmet? And doing these sort of anticipatory guidance things. When you think about the professionals in our field, how are our professionals, our support coordinators, our special ed teachers, really providing that anticipatory guidance to the next stage of that person's life? And even starting to have an eye on what the future could hold for them. The other thing is really helping people. We utilize what we call our life domains. And it's really a way for us to organize and have conversations that are universal, crossing across systems, crossing against different types of stakeholders. These are universal quality of life domains. And I was saying, I was telling the group yesterday, they're really the things you talk about when you show up at a dinner party. So where do you live? Who do you know? What do you do during the day? Start talking about health and safety and security and citizenship. So when we, we want to break those down, we know they're completely intertwined, but we want to be able to break those down and really help people hone in on those. Because for so long in our field, we've just collapsed all that together. And as a family, we'd show up and we'd find a provider, and the provider would take care of all of those things. Well, one, that doesn't necessarily lead to the quality of life a family might have for their child. And two, that's not the way it is anymore. We need to really start honing in and saying, how can, what does employment look like separate from where they live, separate from the health and safety, and really, really being able to hone in on that. So you have a handout in front of you that we're not gonna spend time going over that, that shows each one of those domains. And it actually starts sort of outlining different innovations and things happening across the country that we can really begin having conversations with people to say, you know, the way things are going nowadays, when you need a place for your child to live, 
You go find the house, and then you start finding the providers. The, the day of going and finding slots in different institutions or group homes isn't here. And how can we help people start understanding that and making sense of that? I've already referenced these three buckets, but these are a major way we really organize conversations around the country. When we're talking about practices and policies and funding, what we're saying to our states is, how are you providing information to families across the lifespan? How are you funding that activity? How are you connecting siblings to siblings, parents to parents, grandparents to grandparents, self-advocates to self-advocates? Not only how is it happening in your state, but how are you funding it and sustaining it? I will tell you, those two buckets right there, everybody thinks they're a great idea. No one wants to pay for them. And so how can people start recognize those as valuable interventions, so to speak, that they're wanting to invest in? Because if you invest in those things, families can figure it out better. They can, they can problem solve with one another. They have the information and the skills they need to create the lives they need, which might be a different level of support needed from the state service system. The last part is, is what are states doing as it relates to goods and services? How are states actually supporting the family members? I'm not talking about the goods and services for the individual. That's what we talk about all the time. But who's really providing the services to the family? Like I say, who's putting the oxygen mask on the caregivers and the family members? Because if we're not doing that, they're not going to be there to provide the support that's needed. So how are we providing health and wellness for the family caregiver? If somebody is 90 and they've been lifting their, their adult son or daughter for a long, long time, what is the likelihood they're going to have back issues and, and end up going to the hospital or not being able to provide that level of care? Are we helping families develop special needs trusts and understanding the finances and the way it works with their trust and wills? That's the types of goods and services we're talking about here when it's directed at that family unit. The other thing that we really focus on is this concept called the Integrated Support Star. And I'm going to tell you about it for a couple of minutes, and then we're actually going to do an exercise with it, because it's become really, really central to this framework. And as I showed you earlier, I showed you this picture of this integrated support. And so the star is a way for us to begin thinking differently about how to utilize the resources you have in Connecticut, but really start integrating those. And so what is this and where did this come from? Where it came from was really digging into the conversations of people either get services or they rely on natural supports. But what we started to say is, what does natural supports really, really mean? And no one could really define it, or everyone defined it very, very differently. But it's something we always say in our field, and it's something we either say, what are your natural supports, as we're assessing them, or it's something we say is our solution, well, use your natural supports. And as a family, if you don't know how to describe it for me or to make it happen, then I don't know that we should use that word. So what we started to do is really kind of work with stakeholders and say, what does that phrase really mean? And so what we've done is, is if you sit and you look at it, we know what paid services mean. And that's not just disability services. That's all types of paid services. And the phrase eligibility specific that just means you need some sort of eligibility label. Maybe it's on your social economic status. Maybe it's because of a disability label. That's what eligibility means. Community-based means anything anybody can access. So school goes in community-based. Special ed goes in eligibility-based. The movie theater, your job, parks and recs, the bus system, that goes in community-based. Anybody can access those things. But what we started to do is say, you know, people think about natural supports as being stuff they can use in the community. And they also think about it in terms of the people in your lives. So these are places you go, the people in your lives. So I rely on my mom and dad when I need support on something. You know, I rely on my husband or my neighbors or my, my, my kids' friends on their soccer teams. But the other two parts that do not get discussed in our field very often are technology. And we know that technology is really the fabric of your everyday life. If I remove technology from your lives, one, you wouldn't be sitting here with your phone and checking it every five minutes. Two, maybe you wouldn't have coffee in the morning before you left your house. You wouldn't have electric toothbrush. Now looking at our cars and all the technology that's bringing into our lives. 
Technology is a part of your everyday life. When we start thinking about supporting people with disabilities, it's an afterthought. It's an add-on. Or how can adaptive equipment make their life better? Well, you don't call your phone adaptive equipment. You call your phone essential. So how can we actually elevate the, the focus on technology as a part of the major supports that we're providing to people with disabilities? The part that I'm doing last, because it's actually the most important part, is, is we just sort of gloss over the individual strengths and abilities. And I'll give you that, I'll give you an example. We get calls a lot about transportation. Our first gut reaction is someone called they need transportation. Our first gut reaction is, is, is there some OATS program or sort of disability voucher system that can help pay for transportation? It's the first thing we think of. We just glossed over the fact that we should say, well, is this someone that would have the ability to learn how to drive? Do they walk? Could they figure out how to ride the bus? We really have to start focusing on the strengths that both the individual and the family are bringing to the table and really be thinking about how can all of those be integrated together to really create what we want to do. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to go ahead and stop, and I'm telling you for that for that reason. Or work on exercising more. I can get this out and we can brainstorm if I'm stuck on helping somebody map through those parts of the star. So this is something that, that we've created. It's generic things. So we've had some organizations actually take it and write their local organization specific things in the boxes, or they write their state specific things in the boxes. And in the packets, the big booklets that Robin's put together for you is actually a sheet like that that really kind of has resources by the different parts of the star. So you have Connecticut specific already. But so for example, and again, I'm not going to um, go through this, but for daily, for daily life and employment, um, give me an idea for technology. Uh, we had a cell phone, daily planners. Cell phone, daily planners to help you with your job. If you had um, community living, what'd you guys put for community? The community part of the star. Did you put anything in the, um, the left hand side, the, the community based part of your star? Picking your neighborhood, where you want to live. Maybe you go to your bank and get money, right? You have a real estate agent from the community. Get to know people. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, you were healthy living. What did you guys put down for relationship base for healthy living? Join a hiking group, exercise with family and friends. Yeah, we said like support for, uh, church groups, hiking groups. Excellent. And the reason we do this exercise is, is because oftentimes when we're thinking about supporting a person with a disability, we don't think around all parts of that star. We have gotten into the habit of only thinking about running straight to the eligibility based types of supports. And not only have we started running to do that, we have taught families that that's what they need to do. So a family says, oh my gosh, I have a three year old with Down syndrome and I need to help them potty train. I need to find a professional to do it. Instead of seeking out how do we help anybody potty train first, and if there's some sort of issue then maybe we seek a professional because they have Down syndrome to help them potty train. But we've started to do that with everything we do. And we've created this sort of dependency that the first thing that somebody needs are formal services to get through life. And so how can we actually start changing that conversation? And the STAR is a really neutral way to go about doing that. You can begin having conversations with people and say, well, let's really think about it. What is available to you? What do you currently have? What do we need to put into place? Now sometimes it can be funded through the eligibility-based supports, and sometimes all those things are connected. So for example, if we had relationship-based as a domain that we are working on, and the child is in school and has an IEP, and the IEP would be down there, how are you actually writing goals in the IEP to help develop relationships? There could be a goal about helping develop peer relationships, friendships at school. 
Or if you had something, if you receive adult services, do you have goals related to helping somebody um, see their girlfriend more or, or have strong relationships with their families? So you can use and leverage those to, to help one another in each of the parts of the star. But the star is a way to really help you start thinking differently. It's also to try to help you to break the habit of only running straight to the green part of the star. So we get calls, like I said earlier, from a lot of families. And sometimes the families call and almost ask permission if they use services that aren't disability specific. Like they almost feel bad of like, well, we found an apartment for our child. Do you think it'd be okay with our state office if they live there? That's the kind of culture we've created as a field. And so how can we start breaking that and really giving the power back to the individuals and really helping people utilize the same services and supports that we do for everybody else? This is really, really apparent in employment. When we think about a person with a disability becoming employed, our habit is to say, do they have voc rehab? Is voc rehab at the table? If I asked you how you got your job, it's not through voc rehab. You utilize the people you know in your life. You went to the communities, places that people that knew you and asked them for a job. Maybe you searched it on the computer. We have to help people utilize those same types of problem solving and navigation areas that you and I utilize. And then think about how the disability or eligibility specific supports can enhance those or fill in where gaps aren't there. So what does this really look like? So think about it. If I am a person with a disability and I create supports and I only access eligibility based supports and then those are cut, or my provider not, decides not to provide services for me. I have not figured out any other way of having a good life. So my star is completely green. It is not integrated. And, the, and the, the chance of it going down towards the things I don't want in my life are much, much higher. On the other hand, if I have nothing other than relying on my mom and dad or a family member, we know too that could create a trajectory towards what I don't want either. So what we've got to start moving towards in our field is how are we helping people access more of these things? This is even more and more important as you have people that are on wait lists. That doesn't mean their life like stopped until they get services. That means our job needs to be how do we help you access other things because you're not going to get these right now, or you might never get these. So you still want the good life in the middle of that star. And so what are strategies that we can really leverage and figure out to really help you put together the life that you want? And that's what that integrated support star can mean. So sometimes I'm working with someone who is receiving 24-hour supports. I can use that exact same star and say to them, you know what, how do we really help you develop better relationships? How do we help you use technology to start spreading their supports around? Or vice versa, if someone can't access that green part, I better figure out how to problem solve. We usually have somebody sitting here saying, well, what about the stars for people with disabilities? When are we going to create the problem-solving star for people with disabilities? Well, you just did. You just did. I had a mom come up to me in Maryland and said, well, we did all these really cool stars for how I would get a house. Now, how will my son get a house? The idea is, is to help her understand that we should be figuring out and levering some of those integrated ideas that you talked about for URI. So what does this really look like? So this is one way that actually an agency decided to use the STAR to really build the capacity of their staff to better respond to information callers. So they take a monthly, content, uh, a monthly topic and they, they put it in the middle of the STAR at their staff meeting and say, okay, we keep getting a lot of calls about transportation in St. Louis. So what ideas do you offer the person on the other end of the phone? And what they found out when they used the STAR was one, not everybody around that table knew about all the resources that everybody knew about. So they mapped out transportation. Now this is sitting there right by their phone, so now anytime someone gets a call about transportation, they can all run through that STAR and they feel like they've exhausted what they believe is the, is the most available resources to them. 
So they've used this as a way of building capacity of their staff and also to ensure that their staff are providing all of the possibilities to their callers. This is another way that we utilize the STAR. So we really utilize it for people who um, maybe don't have services or maybe they um, have a, a capped amount of hours. Um, or, or they could even have 24-hour services and, and do this. But so this, what we wanted to do, and this is an example of an individual who receives 40 hours of personal care attendant hours. And the families, they mapped out what their week would look like using the colors of the star. And what they discovered there was that they have green from 8 to 5, and then they have purple. And purple actually consisted just of mom and dad. And this is an individual who's in his 20s. And so the first thing this did for this mom was help her recognize that's a pretty boring life for a 20-year-old. Always to hang out with mom and dad. But also, what happens if something happens to mom and dad? And so the, the support, the sustainability of his good life would not be in place. And so what we started to do was, the first thing we did was we sat down and we mapped around the star what exists in Ben's life. Who does he know? Where does he go? How does he use technology? What are some of his strengths and abilities? Um, and what are some of the services that he may be receiving? And we started to say, this is sort of our bank of supports, is how, how this mom calls us. And we said, how can we actually start making his weekly schedule more colorful based on this bank of supports? And so mom and dad realized, you know what? In the evenings when he's um, wanting to go to the movies or wanting to go to a concert or something, instead of them always taking them, him, which was their default, how could they really start building stronger relationships where people would pick up the phone and call Ben and, and invite him to go? Or Ben picked up the phone and invited, uh, and he invited people to go with him. So they started to add more purple in their life around relationships. But the other thing they started to do was they realized they had self-directed dollars that they could, they could put together a weekly schedule however they wanted, but they seemed to be stuck in the mode of 8 to 5, 8 to 5, 8 to 5. At the same time, they also recognized that the 40 hours wasn't enough to actually get them to and from work. They really probably needed 50 hours from the state. So they really weren't sure what to do. And so at that time, they started to say, what does Ben do during the day with his staff? And ironically, Ben was already going and hanging out at the fire station and volunteering there for four hours a day on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And at that same time, they had a conversation with the captain who said, you know what? It would be okay if that woman did not come with Ben anymore and you could just drop him off. In terms of the hours, this was really a good idea. Ben was really excited not to have a staff with her. The fire station had figured out what to do if there was a call and how Ben would be supported when all the guys were gone. However, the sticky part in this whole situation is that mom was like, wow, I'm not used to him not being around paid supports. And so for a second, she, she said, I don't know if this will work. And then was reminded they're EMTs. But what it does, what this told us, <laughs> What this tells us though, we're not helping families build the trust and become okay with utilizing anything other than paid services. And so how can we build the capacity both of the people that are supporting them in the community or, or relationship based, but at the same time working with moms and dads so that they can trust that's going to be okay. And we kind of gloss over that a lot. I remember my, my mom and dad, when Eric was moving into different living situations, she's like, who's helping me transition? She said, I understand I went through the same thing when I dropped you off at college, so it's kind of the same, but no one really prepared me for what it was gonna be like the day I dropped Eric off, someone I provided complete oversight to for 24 hours, and now all of a sudden I'm, I'm handing him off to somebody else to live? Nobody helps parents with that transition. And it's really, really important that we think about not only that person's transition, but the family's transition. Because if they don't believe it and they don't trust it, they're going to kill the ideas. So how can you really support that? 
So what, once there was some success with that, they were then able to think about other ways that Ben could be supported with other integrated supports. They, he also volunteered at the high school. And so once they were comparable with the um, fire station, they said maybe we can look at the um, high school and see if he could be dropped off there and supported by the, the coach and the students there. And, and he is able to do that. The light blue part is Ben learning how to be alone by himself, starting out in five minute increments. Partly to help Ben be alone by himself, but partly because Jay needed to walk and couldn't take Ben with them. So she started walking back and forth from the stop sign in five minute increments and checking on Ben. She's able now to walk on a trail for 45 minutes. He's got his dog. He knows how to answer the door or the phone or not to answer it. He has his iPad. If something happens, he can text. But this has taken like two years to kind of even get to this amount of time. Jane never, ever, as a parent, ever even thought about the need to build this skill set. And so we have to help parents kind of think about that, even if it's a very limited time. Because what if when they're older, a staff doesn't show up? They need to know what to do. They need to be OK being home by themselves for five minutes. So the parents had to crisscross their um, transportation schedules the other day. And they were able to, too, for the first time, say, it's OK to leave Ben at home, because I will be home in 15 minutes. They've never had that before. And opening up that really helps the family take a lot of stress off of that support. Good so, staff. Plus the technology. I know families do really good technology so they can monitor. There's, there's one or daughter in trouble with climbing by themselves that they can check in and see if there's technology that they're able to. Absolutely. And you know, um, so Jane's having conversations now and saying, we don't intend for a number of years for Ben to move out. But why don't we actually get remote monitoring in our own home and practice this? Um, because we're here, even if it's in small increments, we can go to Costco and get it for $250 and start doing this um, and, and start building the skill set that we both trust and that he also um, can learn how to do. That exact example, um, we, were taught, we were working with this organization that was telling us they were supporting this adult woman who wanted to do nothing but move out on her own. And so they got everything ready, got the apartment ready and everything ready, and mom said, no, I'm not ready for her. And they said, what is your biggest fear? And she said, my biggest fear is that she's going to let a stranger in her house. And the agency said, OK, what if we figure out a way that you can control who comes into her house? And she said, I, I, will, I will try it. So they hooked up a camera to her front door. So when the person rings the, rings the doorbell, the camera actually goes to mom's iPhone. The, the daughter's phone rings at the same time. And the mom can say, yes, this is someone you can trust to let into your house. So it was really about building mom's trust and giving her something to take away some of her security issues. So that Michelle, technology one is a great Michelle, one. Shelly, check out the time. Yeah, I saw it. It's 1020. I saw it. Okay. Um, so this is another example of how someone actually uses the calendar first to then kind of write their goals. So the idea of the star can be used in lots and lots of ways. Um, this is just an example of using it around safety and security. So on our website, and like yesterday, we spent the whole day really honing in on different strategies for problem solving, developing educational materials, and, and really thinking about the STAR as a major component of this framework. The last part of the framework, probably the most important part is, is that nothing we do to really look at policy and practice change, all of it has to involve families and the individuals with disabilities. We've created a lot of practices and initiatives, and they haven't been central, the central voice at the table. And with this community of practices is, how are we helping states get the voice of self-advocates and families to be central in all of the initiatives they do, but especially this initiative as well? So a real quick summary of the framework, and then what I'm going to do is um, we are going to probably pass it over to Barb to work on. Um, we'll skip over the. Um, Act, one of the activities. Okay. Uh, so you see this, you'll see the circles, but this is a quick prompt of all the components of the framework. We're talking about a person. It could be the parent. It could be the child. But the person within the center of the conversation, they live amongst the context of their family. They have the different quality of life domains that we need to consider that are all integrated but can be separated in discussion. 
You've got the three buckets of supports that you always need to be thinking about every time you have an interaction. And you also have the star to really kind of help you problem solve and think through integrated supports when we're thinking about this. So what we'd like to do now is, actually I'm going to skip that activity. Um, do you want me to do the flu? Do the flu shot, okay. yeah. We're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about the framework or how we use this framework to think about some of the strategic activities that are happening around the country. And this will outline a little bit of the way that Barb is going to kind of share some of the examples with you. And so we keep talking about this concept of all and this concept of needing to think bigger than the DD agency. And so what we, what we do is, is we use this analogy around the flu shot. And, and if you think about the flu, first of all, no one wants the flu. But if we did get the flu, we hope that the medical system is available and that it actually is, has the, the best evidence-based practices, it's patient-centered, um, and, and all those types of things. But we know if everyone in the United States got the flu tomorrow, that the medical system is not prepared to service all its patients. And so what the public health field recognizes is that the flu shot can help people prevent the flu. And so those that really get the flu and really need support, the hospitals and the medical system has the capacity to handle that. But what we also know about the flu shot nowadays is you don't just have to go to your doctors to get the flu. You can go to CVS, you can go to the community centers, you can really go anywhere and get the flu. So we have what we call in the middle, this public-private partnership to really help prevent the flu. You take that one step further, and you think about any place that you go of, of business, and you go into the bathroom and you use the soap, and there's antibacterial soap in the bathroom. You, that business, is a part of flu prevention. But when that business runs out of soap, they don't call the hospital and ask for more soap. They have made that a part of their business plan. <clears throat> Take that one step further. Society as a whole, when you go in and wash your hands, you are part of preventing the flu. Not even really thinking about it, it just becomes something you do. And society is a part of preventing the flu because some people go, oh my God, you didn't wash your hands. And then we take that model, that sort of exact concept of thinking about the medical system, the partnerships, thinking about just community organizations, and even thinking about society as a whole. How can we apply that thinking to the community of practice? So what we've done is we've said, absolutely, the long-term service system needs to be the best. We need to continue enhancing it so it's person-centered and it's community-based and it's the best it possibly can be. But if we only focus on that small part of the triangle, we're not going to be able to impact the all. And we're still going to be stuck on this thing of always worrying about money, because money is what's happening over there on that right-hand side. So how can we really start thinking about doing things differently? So if we look at the public-private partnerships in our different community of practice states, we want the state and the government and the community of practice to really say, what's happening there? We've got to invest in there, we've got to connect there, we've got to build the capacity there, and we need to make sure it's all working in terms of sending the same message as the long-term service system. So when our states are saying, is there a family network? Is there a two-on-one? Is there a no wrong door? How are those connected? Are they, are they using the same language? Do they tell the families the same thing? But we even go one step further in the community practice and say, how are we changing the community and society's perception about how we support families? You know, if a grocery store has the adult carts, that's a form of family support, because I can go to the grocery store, be less stressed, and get my grocery shopping done, and take my adult with a developmental disability with me. That's a form of support. If a faith-based organization is very inclusive and families feel comfortable going there and worshiping there and taking their child, that's a form of relief. That's a form of respite, without always calling the state agency and asking for respite dollars. Respite is the small breaks. Paid respite is something differently. How are we helping people get respite across paid and unpaid types of supports? So we look at our community of practice activities and say, this isn't just about what's wrong with your state agency, but this is about what needs to be changed across systems, across the community, and how can we have people that have funding to change these things start making these a priority and really start investing in connecting and enhancing those different areas. 
And maybe Barb and I are just more anxious about the time because we have to get on a plane at 2.45, so. <laughs> so talking about that sort of universal flu shot analogy, like what does that really look like inside states? And how can you really implement that? And, and, and within Connecticut, how are you going to strengthen the last four and five, the fourth and fifth year of the community of practice? Is really thinking about how are we crossing things that people across the lifespan are, are interacting with. So starting at early childhood and going all the way through aging. So when we have community of practice stakeholders come together in other states, how are we making sure that they're all at the table and represented there? So not just focusing on DD, but getting education and, and, and employment and early childhood and pediatricians and recreation and faith-based organizations all at the table and giving them this sort of universal language of this framework to really have conversations to say, how can we make things different in our communities? How can we make things different in our state? So just a concrete example, in the state of Missouri, what we did was we took a number of initiatives and said, can we use this framework to put together materials for your initiative? So if it's an early childhood initiative, can we put together life course educational materials? So early childhood, they're getting the same message. So and the schools agree to it as well. So schools now are passing out life course materials around transition age that's specific there. Missouri has an employment initiative where we said, how can we engage families in the employment conversation? That's one of your target priority areas. Can we develop those materials that you need for your initiative anyway and do it around this framework? In the state of Missouri, we have this folder, which you've seen in Connecticut as well. We produce 30,000 of those folders every six months. And every one of our state agencies hands that folder out. Part of that is to promote symbolically, look, the state agencies are trying to become more integrated and more coordinated. And so they're using the different life domains to start organizing, organizing the way they produce educational things and have conversations. So it's not perfect, it's not everywhere, but the idea now um, is that people can start seeing and getting the same message at, in school as they do as adult services if they walk in the Voc Rehab office or the aging office. And so that's using the life course framework. We've developed educational materials based on that framework that now are being disseminated across those systems. Again, just one example of a way of really kind of crossing that. Ready? I'll turn this on. Let's see, yep. So one of, the, oh, I'll need the clicker. clicker you know, that thingy. So I just have to tell one funny story about washing your hands with a flu shot analogy. Um, we ran uh, not just the uh, home and community-based services. We um, have about 80 people that were in ICFs, but that was it. But um, we also ran all the medical care, uh, acute health care plans, and we also ran um, all the behavioral health. So there was all this stuff about the flu shot, and in the, um, in the bathrooms in the state offices, uh, the nurses put up things that said, if you can sing row, row, row your boat, that's about the appropriate amount of time uh, to wash your hands. So there were all these people, state office people going, row, row, row your boat, and you could hear it as you walked by. But it, uh, you know, it was good. Um, so just to think about this in terms of a system, and I'll spend about 20 minutes on this, um, you know, I'm a systems person, but try to you know, stay as much, you know, because of my family members too as well, what it is you can do to scale up. And a lot of times people think of the community of practice about the tools. And while the tools are extremely important and very helpful, it's the framework and how it's applied that can really make a big difference in Connecticut already has. Uh, but even how to scale it up and make it sustainable. So uh, for the state of Tennessee, they looked at people needing information and they helped looked at that all. The people that were not touching the system, they have some pretty good sized waiting lists, which will get a little bit better. Uh, but they found out that they had 50 something community extension centers, health extension, people also found out about things in their community. And lo and behold, did they reach a lot of people 
uh, with these different packets that uh, you see in front of you. Connecticut has some as well. And they were able to help people reach out and help those extension workers touch a lot of people's lives with information, ideas, community resources, some eligibility based, but it wasn't just the DD system, we're all in it together. We're all members of each other, and the DD systems can't do it alone. The Medicaid systems can't do it alone. Um, they build up to scale in a lot of different ways. They did lunch and learn sessions, uh, starting with DD, but they did them with the school systems, they did it with Child Protective Services, they did it with uh, the Medicaid agency, uh, about the community of practice and what it could bring. They really scaled up. Um, they, in, this is more of a Medicaid group, so I can use a few letters, I won't use as many. You know, there's 1915 A, B, C's, D's, we're down to K. Some people yesterday, when we get to Z, I'm retiring. But, um, <laughs> but uh, they use what's 1115, which is, it can be done in managed care, but it's a vehicle by which uh, people can get Medicaid services. They also have what you have, which is the 1915C waivers. And for the people that chose to get on the waiver, and they have thousands of people waiting to get on their 1915Cs for people with developmental disabilities, they have now, anybody new is going into this other managed care waiver. Everybody with other disabilities, people that are seniors with physical disabilities, with behavioral health support needs, is now going into um, this new waiver. Uh, they'll operate their other waivers for a while until people phase in. A um, couple interesting things happened. Through the community of practice and the influence of the community of practice, they have put in um, family support as a paid service, and they have put significant um, I thought we had Tennessee up there. Oh, but this is more detailed and, and finer. Um, <laughs> and so um, they put in a lot of self-direction. And in their um, self-direction, uh, the pieces you can do is, it's not just really about that they can self-direct. There's also support about learning to self-direct. Um, so what's the responsibility? What's the obligation? So it's do I want to self-direct with the assumption that people can. And they've also put in a significant amount of employment and they were learning how to mix populations while still honoring some of the differences in populations. And they've just mandated that everyone, irrespective of population, all the managed care organizations be trained in uh, supporting families in the life course. Uh, she's everywhere, she's everywhere. Huh? Um, also on sort of building trust, and I'll just go with what slide you put up then. Um, I hadn't studied the PowerPoint you put together slide by slide. Uh, so in Washington, they also reached to the all. Not everybody was being served. There was a lot of crisis on wait list. And so they have done a tremendous amount of outreach to the all. Another thing they did is have a web site that works by phone or it works on the web. And it's a My Life Planning Guide. So it helps people in the system. It helps people that are not in the system to think in this organized manner uh, about these domains, what would be a good life. It does two things. It helps people connect to their community resources, think in this organized way, and brand new, um, they are starting to work in the DD system. So by, when people do become eligible, they are connecting that plan that's already been in the vision of family members to try to make it seamless with their support planning. Makes work pretty easy. What's that? Yeah, that is you all. So we've organized these slides by the outcomes, not by the states, and 
that's why we're kind of jumping around the states. And they've been organized by states before, so that's that's sort of what Barb's, Barb's mm -hmm. looking back into. Um, the other states really focused on how you're going to educate families. And so taking existing initiatives. This isn't about starting with um, something new, unless there isn't something in your state. But so um, in a lot of states, they had partners in policy making. So they embedded life course framework and tools and supporting families into that initiative. Other states did stuff a lot with teachers and school professionals, really recognizing that school doesn't always engage the family and really educating them about life outside of school. Um, the folk rehab counselors have gotten really, really involved. A big, big um, area that we really focused on are really information specialists as well as support coordinators, case managers, or people doing person-centered planning. How can they use this framework to really engage in different conversations immediately at the front door or during planning conversations? So a, a significant amount of the focus around the community of practice has been around capacity building at different levels. We'll get it. Or if we have both of our mics on, um, you'll get more of that exciting buzzing noise. Um, one other thing uh, about the front door is Missouri is a great example. I'm going to speak on behalf of Missouri, and she'll go, "Oh, she should said more, not really that." Uh, but they, um, Missouri has done this really interesting way about thinking about the front door. And uh, mental health is inclusive of the DD agency. That's how they're structured. You know, every state is structured differently. So what is happening there is that um, intake processes can be a little overwhelming. Hi, how you doing? You may qualify. Let me send you, Connecticut may not do this. Let me send you these 40 page application and that's a, that's a little overwhelming. That may or may not be in your language depending on what your language is. And uh, let's see, is your psychological more than two years old? Rats. Uh, and it can be pretty overwhelming. What Missouri has done is actually sends people uh, a referral to the Family Family uh, Resource Center, which is Shelley's group. And they walk people through the Integrated Star. They walk people through some other things. And so that they get a little bit of idea about what's the information, um, how you think about your life, what's going to be a good life, what's going to make sense. So um, it really helps people by the time they make a couple of decisions. Oh, I might have just had this one problem and I don't want to make the call that maybe has the intake person saying, what do you want? I want waiver. That, or they've heard something from other people of, I need ABA and it should be at least 20 hours a week for it, it, that, you know, it's a more enriched conversation, which then helps the uh, targeted case management and support coordinator with a different kind of conversation. Um, I think that uh, two things that are really very interesting is that their support coordination is being reframed. They have a new manual. It's out, it went out for its last public comment. And the support coordination is lined up around the domains. And um, there you go. And quality itself is measuring its outcomes around these domains. So the state of Missouri has really looked at the structure of the, the long-term service system. The long-term service system recognized at their front door, they don't have the means to be more family-centered. They have a lot of statutes that they need to do and a bureaucratic system that they need to follow but they really wanted to enhance and make it more person and family centered. So what they did was contracted with the state family and family resource center and said, when callers call us, we will follow our process, but at the same time, can you have a family information specialist call them? So they invested in us to help them with their internal front door process. So we're not messing with their process, but we're enhancing it by getting those families an immediate person to talk to. What we're finding is, is that many of those families aren't necessarily calling to get services. They're just calling to say, what's going on out there? I'm new into this world, what's available? So we can serve those families, and we can also serve families that are going to either get services or not get services. Again, we kind of serve it all. The other thing that the state structure did was said, um, we really want to organize our quality outcome monitoring based on the domains. 
And so they're using those domains at the, what I would say, the back end of services and really looking at um, and organizing their monitoring activities around those domains. At the same time, at the back end that's happening, what I would call the planning process, the support coordinators across Missouri are trained on the life course tools. They can use them to help educate people. They can also use them to plan with people. And so if you start organizing plans around those domains, I would say it's the front end and the back end are now actually lined up. And you can say these are some of the outcomes and areas that I'm going to look on. So this is an example from one of the agencies of, of an initial assessment and how they take the domains and have organized it for that purpose. And this is just an example of one of the ISP templates that one of the support coordinator entities have done. So they've taken the tools themselves and trained the staff to have different conversations, but they gathered that information and utilized this template for their, the purposes to satisfy the person centered rule. Um, this is another example of uh, Missouri, and I'm actually involved in this one, so. Um, and so what you sometimes hear from states when they're first getting involved about in the community of practice is that, oh my, it's another initiative. We don't have time, we don't have energy, and we think it costs a lot of money. We found that not to be true. And what we've also found is that you leverage whatever initiatives you have going on and it spreads further. And in uh, Missouri, uh, there are several different initiatives going on. The State Employment Leadership Network, um, Show Me Careers, which is um, a project with NASDAQ and the Institute for Community Inclusion for Youth Transitioning, and uh, ODEP, uh, there's another employment grant, and they have woven in pieces of each, of each other's work, and even uh, the Show Me Careers, at the Show Me State, has put together elements of the life course framework and the community of practice right into uh, thinking about transition and thinking before transition. So it's been a really nice way to not say it's something different, it's new, oh my gosh, we've got to put person-centered thinking on top of community protect practice, on top of everything we have going on. And it shows how one helps the other. So this document, which actually you have a Connecticut specific one, is a direct deliverable from that initiative of really combining getting employment of professionals together with families and self-advocates and creating a document around transition to employment. And so that's from that initiative, but it's lined up around the life course framework. So now Connecticut, you have those in your logos, by the way. And that is one centered around um, a school portfolio. And so what it does is actually line up. So you're working around it and schools. And I think that journey through school is something that start out of, U of UMKC. So as organizations, our support coordinators are working inside school districts with IEPs and prepping families, or sometimes even going in and doing conflict resolutions with families. So they utilize these tools, one, sometimes to prepare the student to self-lead their IEP, or sometimes to talk with families and really help them understand what is it they're wanting to articulate in their IEP and what is it they want to work on. Other times staff are using because they're sitting in a room where the school and the parents are really just hitting head to head. And so sometimes they get the star out, the document out, to really get them refocused again on what the student's midlife looks like and how they can really problem solve and achieve that within a school setting. So this organization um, changed it from a one uh, from a school uh, the life profile to really a school profile and really honed in in that arena. And you know, Shelly doesn't like it when I talk about Arizona because it's not a community practice state. But I was hired because of the work we did in Arizona. Only four percent live in traditional people that are supported live in traditional residential, um, and it's because of intervening early. And um, so one of the things, it's this something very similar. Now they're gonna look at the life course tools other than ones I snuck from the community of practice. Um, and they're starting it in birth to three. 
And this is an example also in Missouri about the employment trajectory. And the key is working and starting early. If you start thinking about work, even at the mandatory age, which in some states is 14, and in other states is a little later, and with the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act is going to force it into an age that's a little bit late, but you start where you are, right? And it's to really think about uh, along those domains of contributions and what's happening along a person's lifetime. If they've not had experiences, what can you do to introduce them? If you've had experiences, how do they move to that um, trajectory to, to a job? What's out there in those different domains in community? And as you can tell, the job match for Shelly and I would not be sedentary at a desk in a very quiet, like, IT department. So hopefully, we got those experiences early in life. So this is a vote rehab organization. So the whole region in Missouri, all their vote rehab counselors are trained on the framework and the tools. So this is a, an, an actual example developed by a vote rehab jo and job coach sitting down with an individual using the tools to really think through in their initial assessments how they can use this to think through um, getting employment. So they listed along that line their job experiences and then this is how they're using to kind of really assess the, the employment needs. So this is an example of how to embed it in other systems other than the DD system. So this one's easy. You will get the slide. But the idea, and I think there's a lot of applicability to um, Connecticut here, is around the ADRCs and the No Wrong Door initiatives. And um, so we have a lot of work going on in some different states about the no, no wrong door system. So it has to focus on support coordination and case management. It's, um, and in DC in particular, they are, they're, they're a recipient of one of the no wrong door planning grants. They are looking at, looking across all disabilities, having a friendly no wrong door system, and they actually are modeling it after the DD system. And some of the other systems have sort of admitted that DD is a little bit further ahead than in some of that work about the person-centered work. And uh, in DC, that person there, she's pretty amazing about how to put in some of the person-centered thinking, life course tools, how they apply across different populations. And it's not that different um, organizations are not going to have to do some of their illegal pieces. They know that. But it's to help that people, even pre-intake, when that call comes in, for their intake workers to have some of these different conversations. And so it's the front door, and it also will help them with the settings portion of the new HCBS regulation. It, it will help with all those things. Their counselors will do it. Um, and so they're hoping it will also streamline around their no uh, wrong door initiatives. And um, they have had, so far, some really great su success in um, seniors and aging. And uh, where they're finding some challenges is a little bit in mental health itself. So they're still trying to tackle that one. So we're working with them now on that. And the other piece that, um, that I think has some applicability to your community first choice is how they're dealing with the assessment process. So they're challenging assumptions about what really is needed and what's not, because there's a lot of mythology as systems have grown up over the years and that they're talking cross systems now about what really is in the universal assessment and then what's really needed on top of that, what's mandated, what's not, and how to make something as friendly as possible and still have some relevant questions. And these guys were laughing, but I, I call it Build-A-Bear. What are those little pieces you're going to add on that are most applicable to the people you support? So I think this is a really great example of, again, this initiative, the community of practice is intended to be an unisolated initiative. So DC really is training all of, any intake worker in all of their state agencies on the STAR. And to really say, how are we using the STAR to really think about what other agencies they should be going to? And kind of putting that conversation pre um, state eligibility conversation, um, and so how are they embedding the tools and really building the capacity of intake workers, not only in DD, but 
but in aging, early childhood, drug rehab, that if they're all cons consistently using those tools. The other thing is that the ADRC and Del Rock Board initiatives have the function of, no, of options counselors. How are the options counselors really thinking beyond only options around eligibility, but using the STAR to really kind of enhance the sort of options that people might be accessing to get the supports that they need? So this is just an example. This is their <coughs> initiative, but ways that we're sort of integrating inside that initiative. So wait lists. Yes, there are wait lists. <coughs> Um, so, in Oklahoma, they really begin to tackle that. Uh, it, that's a state with a lot of litigation, as is D.C., and they um, had had a lot of investment in those early days. They were the, one of the first states that had huge litigation around their developmental centers, and, um, you know, happily they're out of it, but it, it's not a state with a lot of resources, so a lot of have, have not. Um, to a rather extreme level in those early days. So what they did is to really look at um, what they could do around what happens around information access. It, uh, it, there was a family member yesterday that is not um, touching the system and she just did not know where to go and we hear that a lot. Um, that people might get directed from one eligibility-based system to another. And this group spent a lot of time about general information access. So you're on the waiting list. And what else? You know, you think about that star, you think about the transportation one and what that agency did with thinking about everything that they could offer. So they've done a lot of that. And they've also done a lot of work across populations, I mean, across agencies with different functions, and most recently really have engaged with the schools, and the schools are excited about it. Um, they also provide a lot of family uh, to family support, so peer mentoring, peer ideas uh, around, for people that are on the waiting list, so they don't feel so alone, nothing like somebody who is living that experience. And um, they're looking at, they, they kind of reconfigure the waiting list to find out who's still interested, how people are doing. And further, um, they got so much attention put to this, there's actually a, a governor's blue ribbon task force on the waiting list, which was an achievement. And uh, some of the community of practice uh, leaders are on it. So they actually used to do this blue ribbon task force, they took the framework and reorganized their question about the wait list. Because this task force has been looking at the questions the same way they've always looked at it, saying, how are we going to get people off the wait list? But rather, we took their current numbers and their data and organized it by the life domains and the life stages and said, what do we really know about the people on the wait list? And what we found about the people on the wait list is that people were accessing services in a lot of the other domains. They just weren't accessing services for the residential waiver that people were waiting for. The other thing that we found out was that most of the people that were on the wait list, say, 7,000 people in Oklahoma didn't even know they were on a wait list or what it actually meant to be on the wait list or what they would even get once they got off the wait list. Um, and that's because in Oklahoma, there was this culture that as soon as you were born and had a disability, everybody would say, you better hurry up and get on a wait list. It's like 20 years old. And so newborn families were putting their child on wait lists and have been for 20, 30, 40 years. And they don't even remember they told somebody that 30 years ago. That and might sound familiar. And they're making data decisions based on these names of people that don't even know that they're making, making data decisions about. So what we've started to do is really reorganize that. We also started to really recognize what, using the STAR based on what we knew about those people, if they were already accessing Social Security, they had housing and they had food stamps, what else did they really need from the labor services? Or did they even need those anymore? Or if the children were younger than 18, were they on Medicaid? Were they accessing EPSDT? And if they were, how could we connect them? So it was about helping people reframe their thoughts about what their needs are, because we taught people to need the waiver, but they have no idea why they need the waiver, when they could actually be accessing other things to get their needs met. So that's what we, re we, we reframed their thinking around our labor. And this is again, uh, oh, did I go backwards? No. Okay, this is again a Missouri example about how an organization 
Um, our, part of it was thinking about the future of the settings portion of the CBS reg, and we know that that's going to be nationally, everybody knows that's going to be the most difficult part, is that it's not well defined by CMS about what is it, what's going to you know, meet the bar. You know, we only have one uh, transition plan that's been approved in the country, that's Tennessee, not a high number. Um, and so people are trying to figure out what's going to work, what's going to no, not work. But this is also a very mission-based organization. So this is what they've done for organizational-based change. And I think, Shelley, you can describe that. Yeah, this, again, is, these are just quick examples of ways people have used the framework. But this shows you how an organization really invests in the framework for all of their thinking. So at this level, they use it strategically. They use the tools and the, the star to really think through how are they going to move their traditional day have services into a more community-based focus. And it just, again, it's just an example on these tools and the framework aren't just about one-on-one -on -one serving people, but rather really this larger framework to flip your thinking about many different levels. Again, this is just a quick one. They use it for team meetings. So the same agency, every team meeting, they think about their goals for a good, good goals, what they do, what's preventing them. And so they're really embedding all of this sort of language across the, the staffing at all levels. So it starts with information and awareness. It starts about thinking about the all, which never goes away, to think about the all. Um, it's more than the tools. When states are it's thinking about that information, it's thinking about bigger changes like policies. It begins to think about what is getting in the way of ourselves. What happens when we begin to think around what's even our Medicaid structure? Uh, what's even in, uh, available out there once you're in the system? And are there things that we can do or things that we can do with our existing Medicaid structure? Um, I think Connecticut has a supports waiver, a self-determination waiver, like one that's a capped waiver in near 1915. Aren't there three different waivers? They all have self-determination. So, you know, how to bolster that so people can think more broadly. Um, so uh, there are states that are looking at using that, that star around uh, a supports waiver and self-determination uh, and to make those things a stretch further. I, I talked about um, the uh, Tennessee already, but that peer-to-peer self-determination, self-direction is really a nice one. And it'll make more people eligible for that self-determination. Uh, and uh, self-direction, because instead of saying, oh, you can get it, use that part if you can self-direct, it's how do we help you self-direct. Um, okay, Washington, uh, this is a really easy slide to work with, but uh, you're also a community first choice state. And uh, some things to think about there um, is how they're beginning to figure out how to work across populations. Um, the community first choice in uh, that state really targeted aging and seniors. And now they're figuring out how to wrap their heads around what happens for people with developmental disabilities. So they're spending a lot of time now on what's going to happen, what parts of the life course tools can they put in there. And what can they do with a universal assessment? So it is a Build-A-Bear that has some things that are appropriate for everyone. And then what can be done in, um, every, you know, most states call them K plans, um, the alphabet rather than community first choice. Don't know why. But what they're thinking about is what are the different questions that can be asked across populations that use a lot of the same ideas, and then what's necessary and most helpful for people in different life situations. 